operations, and um, I don't know the extent of it, that everybody knows about the, the details um, of how anaerobic digestion systems work and that. So from this, we can branch off into uh, a lot more detail um, about um, operations, whether it be from a mechanical engineering perspective or, or biological perspective. But I think, um, you know, what I've, what I've aimed to, I, I think we'll hope we'll, we'll be able to accomplish nicely in, this, in, the, in a lot of time. Um, so just trying to move forward uh, on my slides here, and for some reason it's, I can't, I cannot move forward on my screen, so please be patient with me for a moment here while I try to find out why I can't move my presentation forward. It was moving a moment ago. Uh, Jolene, is it possible for you to try to move the slide forward from your end? Uh, no, Tom, it's not possible for me to do oh, that. Oh, there we go. There we go. Sorry, I guess I had to uh, enable another function. Apologize for everybody for that, uh, that miscue. Okay, so anyway, so uh, moving along, um, the, again, the objective is to provide everybody with quality information uh, regarding biogas systems, and I mean, you could, it doesn't matter um, whether you're an owner, uh, an investor, an operator, a waste management company, uh, thinking about uh, what, what can anaerobic digestion technology play into my business um, and into, into the waste management sector, renewable energy sectors. So th th really, it's just, um, I always try to provide good information. Um, uh, uh, about about the about the industry and technology in and of itself. So just a quick blurb about uh, Yield Energy. So I'm one of the founding um, uh, partners of this company. Started in, uh, I guess I started researching this in 2006, and uh, formally started the company in 2007. And uh, we're a um, essentially a facility designer and integrator. Uh, we supply some equipment, but but not too many components, uh, but some. And uh, we do also do operational work uh, in Canada and the U.S. Um, our technology partner is a German company called uh, Phytech. And uh, you can, there's a, a link there if you'd like to go research them a little bit. They're a small uh, sort of niche market uh, engineering firm. It's a father and son uh, started the company. Um, and the, uh, there's a lot of different types of, of, of anaerobic digest technologies, be it wastewater treatment or, or agricultural and that. And of these different market categories, ours is specifically looking at um, urban organic waste streams, so the, the contaminated stuff, the municipal SSO type material, um, you know, packaged type of organic waste and, you know, anything with, um, um, you know, glass, metal, plastic and those type of, of things in them. That's really what, what our technology uh, is focused around. And um, uh, we also have um, uh, sort of developed through We've taken a, a number of our internal uh, engineering and scientific tools, and we developed this Dr. Digester Scientific Services um, uh, in the marketplace. So we do uh, a lot of operational support. I work with a number of ongoing digesters um, on a monthly program. I, I keep them uh, operating well. I do uh, feedstock analysis. I do uh, sort of a little bit of brokering in 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 the in the in the um, in the organic uh, waste business. Um, I do auditing of waste and things like that. So services provided around uh, helping digesters function properly, which is um, which is always good because it really gives you, me a ground a, foot, a feet on the ground into what the current market conditions are uh, in terms of ongoing operations, um, uh, which is which is which is interesting these days, to say the least. So. One of the things that when I was saying at the beginning, I like to provide good information. Um, a lot of what I'm going to tell you about today in this first sort of overview um, comes from not only being a, a you know, we, we know how to build AD plants and, and integrate technologies and that, but I'm really operating in, in the marketplace. So I'm involved in Canada and the U.S. I'm, I'm personally on the American Biogas Council as co-chair of their Digestate Working Group. 
uh, and uh, I'm on the board of the Toronto ZooShare uh, Biogas Project, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a biogas cooperative renewable energy project. And so, so really actively in the market, I'm trying to bring forward a bunch of real life, you know, uh, up to the minute information for you on kind of market conditions and lessons learned uh, being involved in the marketplace um, as it's unfolding because it's not static. Everything, things change uh, regularly. So, and then also, you know, part of the information and my points in here come, kind of come from looking at uh, not just the Canadian or Ontario experience, but also being involved in the U.S. marketplace and um, seeing what's going on there and trying to relay some of that, that experience and, and information that I have in, in, threaded into here as well. I also, on a personal note, I, I have an agronomy background, um, so I've done soil sampling and, and, and plant nutrition recommendations, and I've also worked and sold um, in organic fertilizer, different organic fertilizer uh, materials, and bought compost in that for different productions uh, in, in, the, in the organic or natural fertilizer marketplaces as well. A lot of our time, is, my time is actually spent working with obviously the waste management industry, the generators of, of this organic waste. So kind of getting right into this, the original, one of the original, um, I did a presentation, I, I do a number of these things a year um, at conferences, and I had a presentation where I had sort of the uh, sort of top 10, sort of a tongue-in-cheek kind of top 10 reasons why biogas plants fail. And uh, this, this presentation is a, um, it's been adapted from that. Uh, and I, you know, it's so I just wanted to tell you because that's originally where, where I had intended to go, but I thought, you know, for more of a, an introductory discussion on operations, I, you know, I, I, um, I would take a little bit of a different angle for everybody here. Uh, but really, just so you know that, um, you know, a lot of what I'm bringing here is, is from, we've seen a lot of failures actually in, in the marketplace and, and maybe not like, you know, uh, just in failure maybe in just in terms of, uh, not a complete business failure, let's say, but uh, but in terms of really things not operating as well as uh, someone predicted they would or hoped that they would for their business, which is not a good thing, uh, because that really impacts uh, revenue, it impacts the, the the industry, the marketplace, the perspective. So um, I'm a big fan of, of of education and and sharing as much information as I can about the technology. And I think it just fosters a, a better growth and perspective. And I I actually personally. Um, you know, seen a lot of consulting engineers, and a lot of people uh, are kind of getting into this AD space, and I actually see a lot of misinformation. Um, you know, recently I was at a conference, and I heard some some you know you know very well respected engineers um, talking about how uh, how they would view a building or designing a plant, and it's not even close to what I would um, describe as to how it's done. So I, I actually in in very professional industries. Uh, very well respected industries, I actually see a lot of, of misinformation about anaerobic digestion, both from a science and engineering standpoint, and I think that that doesn't do our industry, uh, uh, it's a disservice to our industry, uh, and I think that, um, you know, so I'm very happy to, you know, follow up with, with this on, on anybody's questions and that, because I think um, we need to change this as our industry, and, and I don't like things being purported. Um, uh, you know, uh, inaccurate uh, from both the science and engineering standpoint. So, um, so one of the first things you'll hear me talk about uh, when it comes to one of the biggest bailiwicks that I have is is understanding feedstock. And in the composting industry, you you're, you're probably well aware of this and well versed in in, in understanding your feedstock and that. But it, it's it's. I, you know, I wouldn't say it's more critical for, for anaerobic digestion processes, but I can cer certainly see that um, time spent understanding feedstock was not a top priority. I think people quickly get into technology discussions and process discussions uh, before uh, getting into uh, details on, on the organic waste that they plan on processing. And, and I always say feedstock, feedstock, feedstock. The entire process, both biochemistry-wise and mechanical engineering-wise, is driven by, by your feedstock. You just can't spend enough time here. And you'll learn when you get through the process of you're looking at a project or thinking about a project that, that you'll come back to it. It's like a hamster wheel. And you'll, you, you'll, you'll, you'll want to revisit this. And just um, glazing over thinking, well, I'll worry about certain aspects of understanding my feedstock later or they'll sort themselves out. Well, they don't. Um, they don't sort themselves out. And you need to identify the, the, the risks um, in terms of feedstock um, from a number of different perspectives. 
uh, like I said, from a biochemistry perspective, from a physical uh, handling perspective, and, and a plant design perspective, um, it just not enough time can be spent thinking about this. And then also thinking about how your feedstock's going to look for the uh, sort of the, because you're making a 20 to 25 year capital investment. And so I think that um, it's, it's really critical to um, uh, just spend as much time as you can here in, in, in the front end of the process. Um, so, you know, again, we see this in, uh, not enough time being spent on this and not enough time breaking things down from a, a physical and chemical composition perspective. Um, uh, your goalposts for your system stability in general, and again, in the future we'll, we'll dig down on this a bit more, is your retention time, which is the size of your digester, because at some point you, you will decide on a volume and it will be fixed after you've built it. Uh, and an organic loading rate, which is, you know, another way of saying your bacterial um, uh, population. And so, so these are these are the, the thing. These are your your goal. What I call your critical goalposts in des design and operation. And um, nothing can change this. So um, I sort of I have a saying that you know you can you may, you can fool the bank, um, you can fool me, but you can't fool your bacteria. And and so you, you can't get them to do things that they're they're not capable of doing. So everything has a threshold, uh, and um, you know you don't want to be designing a system uh, that's going to operate on the edge all the time uh, uh, in terms of, of your production, in terms of being down or being below your production. So because there's a, um, I think I address this later on, but it's worth mentioning in advance anyway that once you lose a kilowatt of energy production, you, you can't get it back again. And so, um, and that's the thing. You can only, you, if you're at 50% one day or or 85% one day, you, you and you go to 100, that that 15% you lost, or 10%, let's you operate at 96%. Uh, that um, then, yeah, you're just not. Um, you can't get it back again. It's 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 forever lost revenue. So, what do we do when it comes to feedstock analysis and um, and auditing? So we. And again, I think most people involved in the in in the waste uh, management sector will, or in the composting sector, and that will will know about this. Uh, is your physical composition obviously there's there's digestible fraction of material. There's um, there's uh, you know it could be eggshells, bones, metal, plastic. So the undigestible fraction, uh, and you have um, you know there's a process uh, with which you, we implement um, to to do this. So you have to have accurate sampling. Um, and, and how you sample it for your process. So, you know, if you're looking at your AD process, uh, one of the things that we always advocate, um, and we do this for our potential customers, we do a lot of feasibility studies. So we say, you know, before someone's going to commit to or go too far down the road, you know, we need to have accurate input data uh, into um, into our, our mass balance calculations and our, our, our you know, our outputs and our estimations for um the energy yield from from your material and, and whatnot. So, you know, we actually take samples and we shred it through our equipment and 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 that. And so we 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 can get an accurate output of material and we can actually tell you, um, you know, what your expected gas yield from a real actual sample of feedstock that that you have. Um, so we um, another part of this process involves obviously separating the contaminants, understanding what portion of your organic material is contaminants and, and for two reasons. One, um, from an energy balance calculation perspective, but then also, um, you know, knowing um, uh, mechanically uh, from a system design point, what do, how are we going to deal with this material? Uh, again, it involves drawing, weighing, and calculating, so standard sort of auditing type of procedures. Um, then there's the, the chemical composition, which is the, the generally the, the where we calculate the energy yield from from a, a given volume of material or, or mass of material. Uh, so in in for for bacteria, um, anaerobic, these anaerobic bacteria, the only thing that you can get energy from are carbohydrates, fats, and protein. Um, you measure your ash content, total solids. Um, and um, and you know your moisture content obviously and those are you know that's throughput but it's not energy yield uh, and um, you know looking at and and really um, the two critical components in your chemical composition for anaerobic bacteria are fats and proteins um, carbohydrates are not generally the limiting factor usually uh, your um, your nitrogen load uh, and your organic load is is heavily determined. Uh, by your your fats and your proteins. Uh, that's not to say that you can't overload something with carbohydrates. It, it, you, it's possible, uh, but it, it doesn't happen as quite as often. 
And of course, your outputs, what you're trying to figure out from this input um, uh, uh, type of analysis, uh, often called in the industry biomethane potential, BMP testing. Uh, it, it's really is, is what your biogas yield and your methane yield. So how many, uh, how many cubic meters of, of methane is generated per ton of, 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 of feedstock? So that's, that's really what you're, you're, trying to, um, you're, you're trying to sort out. Because that's the only, the, the methane is the only um, uh, energy, that's your revenue generator from the, the gas side of things. So from that breakdown of, of once you're looking at your feedstock, then you're kind of taking a you step back and you say, okay, well, what, is, what does all this mean? What, what does the, the, the physical composition, obviously that's, that's more of a, um, again, a mechanical process type of issue. Um, but then we look at the, the chemical composition and that feeds into what we do next in our, our pro the way we approach it is we, we look at, we essentially assess the biological system. Like what are these carbohydrates, fat, and protein? What, what, what are they going to do? Um, um, so how are they going to impact um, your, your digester? So when you're looking at your feedstock, you know, let's say you have 10, 15, whatever, 20,000 tons of material, um, how much you're going to put this through your digester, you're going to have a volume, um, you're going to decide, you know, uh, what you're loading, how much organic load you're going to have in here, and then um, you're going to you evaluate the system. Will the biological system support um, uh, the complete digestion of this material in the volume, in a, in a given volume, right? So, so this is what we call biological system analysis, and we're looking at things like feedbacks, uh, feedback loops, uh, and, and it's sort of the two critical ones are pH uh, and, and also buffer capacity and, the, and your nitrogen, um, as well as your organic load overall. So those are kind of the critical points. There's a lot more than that to consider, but, but really those are the sort of the main pillars um, in assessing, you know, if you can, if you have something that's too much protein, for example, then you may have to cut back on it, uh, cut back taking it or uh, add more dilution, um, things like that. So. The next thing that we do, um, which is unique to our company, um, is we have a, a, what's called a, a biotip simulation. It's, it's actually a, a proprietary software program that we use, um, and we model all of the uh, it models all of the anaerobic digestion, biological, pro, biological, biochemical processes simultaneously. So we run it's a predictive model, and we run we run um, this on on a, on a given substrate. So we, it can be any combination. Like I've run scenarios for clients where we do like you know 10 or 15 different feedstocks and we input the, all the different you know uh, total solids carbs fats proteins ash we, we input it all uh, and then we we can change the volume so let's say we start out with a you know for lack of a better a 30 30 30 split for three feedstocks and we can change that and uh, um, you know you know 40 40 10 whatever whatever you want to do um, um, for different different amount of, of, of feedstocks. So you can change the ratios, that's what I was looking for, ratios of feedstock, uh, and simulate it, and what the output's going to be, how's that going to affect my biological stability and my energy output. Um, then the other um, aspect is, um, if you have a digest that's already operating, uh, we can do an in situ, so we take a sample of the, of the digestate in situ, we run an analysis on material. Um, for example, um, we input it into the biotip or we run separate analysis for things like ammonia, fatty acid content and, and profile, um, you know, micronutrient concentrations and availability and things like that. That's, you know, that's, that's for a system we, if we do a remediation project. That's the kind of data that we're looking to, to, to get. And it could be um, a wastewater treatment plant or it could be um, uh, typically Right now, the large part of the, the marketplace is sort of farm-based uh, digester, what, what the industry terms co-digestion, which is mixing um, agricultural animal slurries with, with off-farm, like food, food waste or food processing waste type of materials. So the other part of and thinking about the feedstock and spending an appropriate time um, uh, on, on your feedstock is to, uh, is to look at the contamination level. So, um, you know, we often say no pretreatment system can clean feedstock 100% before it gets into a digester. Uh, depending on the technologies or technologies chosen, it can. Um, one of the biggest factors to consider is uh, looking at your water balance. So, how much water is is, um, uh, is going to be utilized by this technology? Um, so, you, again, if you're in the composting industry, you know this that, that, that removing contaminations is about density differences. Um, so. Um, 
and you know, you can't cook this. The next point with both a heavy and light fraction of contaminants will get into your digesters just to say that um, you can't clean everything 100% before it gets into your digester and you will have both uh, components uh, get in in some sort of a percentage form at all. Uh, a good pre-treatment solution is a system design, not just a piece of equipment. I can't emphasize this enough. We see this a lot and it's uh, kind of problematic in our industry about people trying to um, shoehorn in uh, simple pieces of what, what are kind of standard sort of depackaging equipment for, um, I guess, mono fractions of waste like yogurt containers or, you know, uh, HDP type plastics and that. Um, but when you get into food waste and wet waste and film plastics, the, the whole science behind separating all this becomes a lot more difficult, obviously. And, um, and this, you know, sort of the process, the, the repercussions on the process downstream from this activity um, is not often, um, uh, there's not often, in my opinion, there's not enough time spent understanding its impact on plants. Um, and well, the good news on, on the good news out of all those sort of concerns are that is that you actually can retrofit projects. So you can actually um, done properly um, to a limited extent. If you have a system design and it's not meant to, to clean material, but you want to clean material, um, you can. Uh, there's some there's there's some nuances to that, and I'll do a seminar on on just just the issues on removing contaminants um, from from organic feedstock for AD. Uh, but it's, you know, yeah, there's a lot of considerations um, you have to think about if you want to get into this. Um, uh, type of work if you if your if your plant if you already have one let's say that that's not meant to deal with this material. So one of the other um, issues that we see in the marketplace um, at, just at a high level is that we, we often see people again this comes this is a lot of these slides are obviously related to like I said beginning understanding your feedstock and building too small to just capacity for biological stability is probably the number one issue uh, um, that we've seen kind of develop in the market. Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly, um, you know, this, this kind of discussion between a client, a potential customer, and a technology provider. Um, so, so, you know, I often come in on a remediation project and I see the results of these discussions, but obviously I wasn't there for them, so it's sometimes hard for me to discern exactly what people were thinking. Um, but, you know, I can sort of deduce that, you know, not knowing your feedstock or un imp unpredictable feedstock marketplace uh, for supply often plays a big factor into this. Um, and there's always a trade-off, and maybe some of it's saving capital, uh, but just remember that it's difficult for you to control your feedstock for, for a 20-year period of time to a certain extent. And so, so long-term planning and thinking about what this means for my biological system, my capital expenditure, and looking at all this from a from a from a good business planning perspective is, is really important. Uh, and, and in fact, it, it kind of you know doesn't matter whether it's a um, it's a, a, a like a, a in, like a commercial project, a merchant facility we call it, or a farm project, or a municipal project. Um, you know, w uh, desires to you know uh, co collection systems and. Uh, from from a municipal perspective, you know, collection programs and systems um, will change, and so I think looking at technology, you know, for uh, for uh, resiliency, for being robust in that, and, and having some flexibility is really important to consider. And one point, you know, in Ontario, uh, there's a lot of, again, by jurisdiction, every province and, and and state in the U.S. has different regulations on this, but um, you know, using combinations of waste. Uh, just so you understand, you know, generally speaking, um, agricultural waste and, and manure, dairy manures at nine percent don't produce a lot of energy. Um, you know, he, here a typical 500 kilowatt project would produce, uh, you know, if you have about 250 or 200 milking cows, you, you get about 125 to 150 kilowatts of energy, and the balance comes from food waste. So the tail wags the dog, as I say. So even though even though you have a sort of can be misleading, a farm project is is on a farm. You have to understand that the, 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 the largest economic and contribution, but also biological limiting substrate is this food waste or off-farm food processing waste that comes into this plant, into this facility. So, um, you know, we say, well, it's, it's agricultural, it's manure, but it's not. It's really a waste treating plant because, uh, because of the, uh, look at the biggest driver. Um, uh, and this is important to consider. Like, look where, where's the money? You know, show me the money. Where's the money coming from? Follow it. That's the driver. And, and just be aware of that um, from, from a plant design perspective. Um, building too large to disk capacity, um, you, you know, in some ways you can't do this, but at, at some point, you know, you have a capital budget. So, um, 
I kind of see this more uh, of a, a build it and they will come model, kind of a merchant facility model type thing. We've, we've seen a few of these in Canada and the U.S. and um, they're risky business models. I don't I don't advocate this or or kind of thinking about it. And actually, we, in fact, we're, we're I don't think these are going to be the largest number of plants built across North America. I think that you know the largest um, the industry is headed towards farm digesters and uh, municipal projects, and you know organic waste will find its home to one of these sites. Um, and and I think that's both both facilities in, in the United States. To give an example, sort of this commercial project. Uh, there's some large grocery store chains that what we call sort of the mer uh, this merchant facility or purpose built plant, where a large retailer commits to supply for a project. So that is is a commercial project, but it's not really a merchant facility because um, there's a contracted supply agreement. So that facility knows what they're going to get for the next 20 years. So there's a supply contract on that side of it, and, and it's, it's a lot less risky, and then you can know your substrate. So um, that's kind of what, what I see developing in that part of the market. Um, yeah, just remember, obviously, if you're not filling, you know, you know are you able to generate uh, material uh, revenue from the volume uh, that you've, you've, you've built for? Um, and uh, and again, if if you've miscalculated your supply side of the equation, then you may be taking material uh, such as if you was that a clean plant or not, that, then um, you may not be able to get all the material uh, that you uh, wanted, and you stuck taking a feedstock that, that that you didn't want to take, whether it has a lower energy yield or um, or it's physically contaminated. And you're not you're not meant to handle that from a process engineering standpoint. Um, yeah, just some of you. I mean, you're possibly if you're looking at doing this, you're trading short-term pain uh, gain for long-term pain. Um, um, but again, it's it's really it really comes down to um, uh, what I would say is just kind of narrowing your uh, spending more time on the feedstock supply side, uh, and 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 you can solve a lot of these these issues. Uh, so budgeting for support services, um, obviously we, we do this and we get into this and so I wanted to throw up a quick slide about, you know, the successful guys that are, we see in the project are, are, are paying for services. Um, if you have a core business, um, you know, if you're largely, if we see this here in Ontario, if you're an ag-based business, you're a farmer, um, you know, you, you, you know, you're going to build a project, are you really going to look after this? Do you have the skills and expertise and the time? Um, and um, and if you don't, and if it's not operating properly, and you're spending more time doing this, then you know potentially you could have an, uh, both an emotional and financial drain on two businesses: on the core business plus this business, this biogas business. So you have to be careful about it. And it's quite reasonable, generally, I would say. Uh, we've seen. I just threw up an example here. Um, you know, on a 500 kilowatt plant project, um, you know, plus or minus uh, uh, just a ballpark cost. Um, uh, what it might cost for some some trace elements, some um, support services, um, uh, some di you know different products and that, um, and feedstock lab analysis, um, shipping for 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 digestive analysis, things like that. So there's a lot involved in that. But just to give you an example that um, you know I think it's actually a very good good payback uh, that that we see on on these sort of things, and we actually see a lot of plants that are that are you know between 50 50 percent. Uh, or 30 and 50 percent uh, decrease um, lower in production than they estimated they would be, and so so you know the, the the paybacks that we've had on the projects we worked on have been quite tremendous and have been really great return on investment overall. So one of the the myths that I, I'd like to kind of dispel about this um, is that um, you, you if you add enough manure, you can stabilize your digester and get maximum gas yield production. That, that's not necessarily true. Uh, you can add uh, anaerobic bacteria need a certain uh, amount and concentration and availability of trace elements um, or micronutrients. And so um, we, we develop a feeding program for, for these bacteria. And again, just to say that, you know, just because you've built a digester and you know how to feed from an agricultural perspective your animals and all that, and you can manage it, manure and whatever, um, there's the next skill and expertise level that I, I don't think a lot of people predicted would ne would ne would be necessary. Um, but I, I can tell you that it is, and 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 there's good return on investments and good evidence in our market here. I mean, the Europeans do this regularly uh, in their marketplaces, and and um, and we see this we see the same thing here. Um, you know, and also, I mean, actually, uh, we operate our digester, our food waste digesters, with no manure at all. So we, we're actually able to feed the bacteria all the nutrients they need without the addition of manure. So it's not really 
Uh, aside from inoculation from either wastewater treatment solids or, or, or animal uh, dairy slurries, once your bacteria is inoculated, you can keep them, uh, keep them alive um, and their population is robust and healthy and reproducing to the maximum uh, through, through um, a feeding program. Uh, again, just as on the support side, um, you know, these are just a, sort of a shopping list of items um, that, that uh, you know, that if you have support services, um, you, have to, you know, what you're doing for a project. So when we go into a project, we're looking at, uh, you know, daily monitoring, looking at the logs, doing back calculations to make sure all the energy balance numbers that are reported from the gen set and the gas yield and the percentage of methane, that's all, um, all adds up. Um, and so we track this along with customers, and, and again, you know, just a, 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 there's just a shopping list there of, of things that we typically monitor um, and look for uh, from a day-to-day -day operational perspective. And um, yeah, and some of these skills are not just because you've built a biogas plant or you you own one. Um, most people don't have the skill set uh, uh, to monitor these things are listed here. Okay, so uh, digestate. So now we're kind of getting towards the sort of the we dealt with the front, the middle, and towards the back end of the plant now. Um, so, so I, I was, I've seen a few projects. Now, obviously, if you have built a farm project um, and you you have you know you're building a, a dairy based system or manure based uh, anaerobic digester, you've got the land, you've got your nutrient management plans, um, then you've got an adequate land to deal with with uh, your digestate. Um, but you know, if you're uh, maybe if it's an urban project like an SSO type project, or or um, or a uh, sort of this commercial merchant facility type of project, you know, where are you going to put your digestate? It's costly to uh, centrifuge your solids and and clean it up through an SBR MBR, or and then and dewater it, uh, and then and then clean it up for for sewer discharge. So and and in a way, it's you know um, you know it's it's expensive to do that. Um, and so, so what are we going to do with digestate? What's the long-term strategy? I don't think anyone's really sorted this out. Recently, I, w I was involved. Uh, we designed a survey of the 160 or so biogas plants in the United States. Um, the EPA wanted to know um, if anybody was landfilling the digestate. And, and you know, from our my perspective here in Canada, I thought, well, this was a crazy question for them to ask. Um, so we developed this survey. We've got a you know very detailed survey. Actually, there's a webinar on this from the uh, ABC on, on Friday. Uh, but uh, to you know, there's a couple people we highlighted who are doing a good job at generating revenue from the back end of their businesses um, here. And uh, but what people were doing at Digestate was was uh, was a dog's breakfast. It was all over the map. There was all kinds of things being done to create value from this. Uh, a lot of innovative things, but then a lot of things that raised a few eyebrows. Um, and so you know. Um, you know, you you have a material that you're putting out. If it's a if it's a a, um, a wet system, then you've got a solid content of six to eight percent. And so, what are we going to do with this material? It's you know generally three to five percent nitrogen and um, you know one to two percent um, uh, phosphorus and you know maybe you know four percent five percent potash. So so and plus a whole host of organic matter and all a bunch of you know, micronutrients and calcium is great, magnesium good levels. So it's a good product. It's excellent for fertility. Uh, but what do we do with it? And, and, you know, how do you create value from it? Because it actually has a real value, but it's often challenging to, to achieve this value. So, um, but, you know, thinking about what, what's my plan? Because it, if it ends up being a net cost to get rid of or, or this material or you didn't, you know, count on it, then uh, what, what, where is this going to be in your budget? And, and a, from a stability standpoint, um, from a business model, you know, you need to have a, an adequate plan. So right now, comp so the other big issue in our in the industry is competition for feedstock. So we, you know, in any given, even in the U.S., like feed, uh, feedstock, the supply and demand dynamics are very localized because it's expensive to truck um, organics far distances. So so regardless of whether you know it's a big country or small country or where you're going to get uh, the development of of supply and demand characteristics that are the same everywhere, and where you have a certain amount of capacity, and then tipping fees drop, and then um, so there's all this, 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 which, 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 and from the composting industry, I'm sure a lot of anyone who's in the commercial composting is probably, I'm sure everyone's experienced this, and so, so just be aware of it. I think a lot of people that got into into the AD marketplace weren't really 
and we're looking at it more from an energy generating perspective and not as a waste management service, which I, I thought was a bit strange and um, maybe naive. Uh, but it clearly, you know, the the competition for feedstock uh, happens, and it's really um, it's really acute, and and it can really affect the economics of a project um, from a tipping fee perspective, from an energy generating perspective. Because um, once you've built your system, you have a fixed volume, and and if you're not, if the material's coming in weaker in energy content, um, then w what do you do? And so so there's a lot of challenges around this, and. Um, and it never stays the same, right? Um, so, yeah, there's just again, a few other additional points in here. But again, um, truck, obviously trucking distances uh, pay, a big, uh, pay a big factor here. Okay, so again, feed, where, where are your feedstock coming from? And... Um, uh, where is it going today? So just some critical questions. I sort of kind of crammed it in together here, uh, but there's a lot of questions that need to be asked um, around these supply and demand dynamics. And you know, where is it going today? Have to truck it there. Is it clean feedstock? Am I going to get into cleaning it? Do I want just already clean stuff? Um, you know, land application. You know, what are my competing land landfilling? Just straight landfilling organics. So in certain markets, uh, you can just landfill it. It's no big deal. So. So what are these, what, you know, what, how do these play um, into um, managing, um, you know, my supply side of the equation uh, today and tomorrow? Um, and, um, you know, what will you do if you're, what will you do from a, a plant, a lot of waste management companies that I work with sort of ask the question for guys, if, if your plant shuts down or you have a biological problem and crashes, well, where's my material going to go and what's your contingency to deal with this? Um, you know, do your suppliers look for take or pay contracts? So these are all all issues that we've seen in the marketplace and um, you know when you're in your planning of a project and your or day-to-day -day operations these, these are serious questions that you need to have have had some put in some serious time considering um, so I think this or this is a comment I guess you could read this uh, this overestimating of the impact of capex um, you know, maybe um, well, I've seen this, and, and really, what it means is that you, someone didn't want to spend the right amount of money for for the technology. And uh, spending a bit more capital up front is is I would say the a better thing to do. Uh, and um, and I guess if you know, and always plan for additional capital expenditures to to meet um, um, you know because you can't predict everything. So you'll you'll having some contingency built in there. I think is is a really good idea. Um, you don't have to spend it all right away. You can phase it in later, but but be prepared for this. Don't necessarily work and, and maybe spend all of your money um, uh, right right up front, um, but plan to spend extra. And you know, if you're if you're spending the ca a certain amount of capital on a project, you know, and you say, well, maybe I'm going to spend a little less. I want smaller tanks or different equipment. Um, you know, this, remember this is a 25 year. It's essentially a, a it's an infrastructure investment, and and if you're you want to spend you know you're amortizing things over a very long period of time, and so I think that um, my recommendation anyway is the experience of the people that that didn't um, you know think about the long term implications of their decisions um, you know they end up spending the money anyway, and then it costs more afterwards because you know obviously if you're building something extra it's, and you have people already working on site it's cheaper to do the work. Um, so how do you reach the right balance? You know, there's again, there's just a few points there. Uh, look for your tech, the right technology partner. Um, really spend time understanding feedstock, and then your technology supplier, if they're good at what they do, should be able to have a robust feedstock discussion with you. And I think that's what's lacking in our industry right now is a lot of guys just want to shy away uh, from this. And there's a lot of shell games that can be played with with, with potential customers, and I, I don't think it's very professional. And I and I think. That if you have the right technology partner, they should be able to make you. They should be able to make you aware of the feedstock risks, um, and I and I think that's critical. And you have to make sure that both you, uh, your your feedstock supply partner, and your technology partner are going to be there all together in uh, for the long haul with you. Now they're your. They should be your support team, and and having um, all of those three parties yourself, your feedstock supplier, and your technology partner should at some point be on the same page. And and if you're not. Then, then I think that's a red flag uh, on the project, and of course, reference sites, technology, you know, of your suppliers, etc. 
Oh, that's the last slide. So, so I think I'm 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 doing fairly good for time. Uh, so, so I guess we can go to the um, the question and answer uh, period of the of the conference. Yes, uh, Tom, you are right on time. So, uh, if anyone has questions, please uh, raise your hand or send them in through the chat, and we can uh, we can ask Tom here while he's available. Are people going to be, I guess, texting in or? Uh, yeah, they have the option to text in or uh, use their microphone. Oh, okay. And uh, yes, I can. I, I just I couldn't see my. Um, I can bring up the presentation again if required. So. Okay. I just I I, can, I couldn't see the presentation over. Um, okay. Um. Barsha from Manitoba Conservation is asking, what software is used for biotip simulation? Right. So that's actually our own it's our own internal developed software. So um, yeah, so we do we do the modeling ourselves. And one of the key differences, so there are wastewater treatment um, modeling softwares like ADM1. But where those those are um, are are meant for different uh, different application. Those we w when we developed the software, um, it was because that software wouldn't work for the high organic loading rate substrates. You know, we're putting stuff into the digesters. Uh, in our case, uh, at between you know, any, I mean, obviously, up to let's say twenty five percent total solids. So that organic load. Um, the models for wastewater treatment don't they're, they're dealing with stuff that's four percent total solids or, or or less so so the organic load is the critical difference um, uh, in terms of in terms of that uh, software um, uh, that modeling software okay and Barsha's follow-up question is so it calculates the material and energy balance you know it calculates uh, it calculates a number of things it, it calculates in fact, the the um, the, the model uh, estimates things like the, the predicts the pH, the buffer capacity, organic acid development, um, the total solids, um, ammonia and ammonium, and uh, components. So it, does, it actually all of the uh, and then as well as uh, the 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 methane yield, the the CO two yield, um, things like that. So the critical parameters for bio chemical stability or biological stability. So it calculates that. And from there, uh, we can do the rest of the energy balance and, and whatnot from the project. So, so it, we input it. The output from the software, we use it to, to enter into an energy and mass balance. So that when we get into the engineering side of the, of the project planning. Sounds pretty fantastic. Thanks for your question, Barsha, and thanks for the answer. Uh, Sophie from Recycle Quebec is asking, what is your opinion on municipal AD installations, waste management orientated, and the necessity to find markets for the digestate? Right, so that's a good question. Um, it's a good big broad market question for the first one. So um, I guess there's, there's um, so my opinion is generally for, and I'm aware of the, the, the Quebec market. and. Uh, and what's going on there to a certain extent anyway. And I would say that, OK, so my opinion is um, that you have to look at your feedstock. And AD is appropriate for uh, feedstocks that um, uh, want to be wet, so food waste. So urban organic waste is ideal uh, for anaerobic digestion. Should anaerobic digestion be um, um, uh, mixed with leaf and yard waste? No. Uh, and my opinion, my opinion is uh, that you shouldn't, a municipality shouldn't collect leaf and yard together. Uh, so, so I, I, I think that the, the, the best strategy, and, uh, and the reason is that the capital cost to compost leaf and yard waste in windrows um, is cheap. It's, it's known. Why build expensive uh, aerobic uh, composting systems to handle, uh, manage the, um, the, uh, the fatty acids that impact the biological stability of an aerobic system, and you have a very expensive process. Um, I say, you know, my opinion is the municipalities should, should separate it. Leaf and yard waste and, and, and dry material should be uh, composted aerobically inexpensively. 
uh, and then the rest should be uh, dealt with food waste. Uh, uh, should be done in an anaerobic process because it wants to be wet. It's a wet material to begin with, and then when you break it down, all the moisture is released. So, and I think there was a second part to the question. But um, yeah, what is the necessity to find a market for the digest digestate? Yeah. So, so well, I guess it's not. I, there's, there's the, the it, it's. I guess it depends on your local condition. Um, generally speaking, we're seeing, for example. Uh, a lot of work is being done to separate the nutrients, right? So the the, N, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium, and PK from from digestate. So uh, trucking water is expensive. So if you come up with a digestate that's seven percent uh, total solids or six percent total solids, uh, then you know how are you going to manage it? If you have nearby access to agricultural land that you can send it all on, I think that's the best the best reason. Because if you're implement separation technologies so the you know the saying that the parts uh, do not equal the whole so if you're separating your nitrogen it's great you have those nutrients and you can try to sell it at a market value for commercial urea uh, um, or, or, or potash or, or whatever um, or you know uh, a supple mag or whatever the fertilizer may be then but then you're missing organic matter you're missing the micronutrients you're, you're missing all of the extras that are available um, that become mineralized and available for your for your plant. So, it would be best from a, an, a soil's health perspective and a crop yield perspective to to, to just put digestate fresh uh, from your digester, uh, you know, unseparated, un, not not further processed through SBR MBR. To do it that way, that's my opinion. Economically, is it achievable? Um, that kind of depends on your local condition. Um, that's really what 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 we see, uh, what I see is developing in the marketplace and. Uh, the separated solids, um, you know, there's more market value. People are trying to create a compost material from it. They're trying to use to make peat moss replacements. So there's a number of activities and research activities uh, in that um, that uh, may yield some revenue. But again, um, it's uh, it's early days, and I don't think anyone's done that on a large scale. I just wanted to go back to the original question. One more thing I wanted to add about about sort of separating, you know, from municipal material um, that AD systems can do a really good job at separating contaminants because of the breakdown in solids. Whereas if you mix it you know, with, with leaf and yard waste material and high solids, then it's actually very difficult to clean your material. So the other benefit of separating things and doing AD for, for food, urban food waste uh, is that you get to, um, uh, you get actually, you get, you produce a, you're able to produce a clean digestate, which feeds into your second question and, and, and opens up, I think, the opportunity to uh, recoup some uh, financial uh, returns on it. Okay. Are you seeing any other questions, Jolene? No, I don't see any up at the moment. Huh. Excellent. Okay, well, if, if that's all. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, I accidentally had myself on mute. Oh. <laughs> uh, Dan has a question, um, and he's from Sedum. So, Dan, if you want. Sorry, I can't hear anything. Me neither. Okay. Can, you can't hear anything right now? I can hear you, but we couldn't hear Dan. Okay, he's also typed it in here, so I'll just ask it. Okay. Um, what sort of feedstock challenges would smaller communities have in managing a municipal system? Okay, so what feedstock challenges would a... I'm sure I understand it. So, what challenges would a smaller municipal system have with feedstock? Is that what I understand? Yeah. Would a smaller community have um, to manage? Okay. If so, you're... if it's a municipal, if it's a muni if if it's a smaller municipality and it's 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 household organics that you're collecting, um, you, I you know I think from what I understand, you know whatever households produce it. I guess it would be the challenge is your total tonnage per year. Um, I would generally say that if you're looking at less than 15,000 tons a year, it'll be tough to make the economics work. 
Um, but if you've got 15,000 tons per year of feedstock, then then I think you're um, you're you're probably you're probably doing well there, and, and that's a good good economic opportunity. And now I'm assuming, and when I'm saying that 15,000, I mean that's a, um, a system where uh, you know um, it's it's there's you have to remove contaminants like plastic and metal and glass, and that's so I'm assuming it's not really a clean necessarily a clean feedstock. It's 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 a more urban type of material, so there's extra cost to do that. But I'm assuming. Yeah, if it's coming from residential, it won't be that clean um, necessarily. So, but that kind of depends. So, I suppose if it's cleaner feedstock, you could probably drop that total tonnage down economically uh, to do so. But you know, um, but I would say, yeah, a good rule of thumb would be would be to say about fifteen thousand tons a year. But you could supplement. So, I guess if you're limited, if you, if, if you might have some additional food processing nearby or other material you could get uh, that you know, financially makes sense or it's hard for, more expensive for somebody else to get rid of, you could actually supplement uh, your feedstock with some commercial material um, if the business case made sense. Excellent. Um, okay, and then another question from Barsha. Um, going back to the leak, uh, the digest state, he's asking, what do you think about leachate recirculation in an AD system? Uh, right, so so it's doable uh, for sure. Uh, you just have to nitrogen. So you can't operate a digester at more than um, five grams per liter in nitrogen. So so you can do it provided your protein content uh, and your your total nitrogen balance doesn't get greater than that. So that's all you have to watch is your nitrogen. So you might be able to, you might be limited as to how much you could recirculate. But we in our systems we usually uh, we actually do recirculate to keep the additional water, only if it's a high total solids material. If your total solids material is low, um, then you don't need to often use uh, additional water, process water. So that kind of that's sort of a twofold question. It's a biological question and a process design question. And if you if you if your feedstock, if your total solids, including contaminants like glass and bones and inerts. Uh, uh, grit, sand, and all that included with the organics is only 10 to 15 percent total solids. Um, for example, we can input uh, that directly into our digester, uh, so we wouldn't need. We don't really add dilution water until it's over 25 percent because that's what the equipment is designed for. So it's you know, but somebody else may not do that. Somebody else, a technology provider, may only be able to input at 15 percent. That's what their pumps can manage. So then you would have to recirculate uh, some of that water, and you know, if, if it's not a, a big difference as to what their mechanical um, equipment can handle and what their total load from incoming feedstock on nitrogen is, then then there may be an unlimited, um, well, not unlimited, but uh, you know, a lot of leniency as to how much you could recirculate. Okay, um, if there's any more questions, you can quickly get them in, but otherwise I thought that was a great question and answer uh, period. Um, I guess one just quickly can't snuck in here, Roland uh, from, oh, I'm not sure where you're from, Roland, but um, he says that the digestate may be good to water windrows or leaf and yard waste. Has this been your experience? Uh, I, I agree with that. G generally, I think you could, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you need to add water in, your, in where you're located, then, then it's for sure it's possible, possible to do that. Uh, um, your, it would be an additional nitrogen uh, to generally what you're using is more high C to N ratio stuff. So um, adding digestate to whether it's a solid or in liquid form to a windrow composting is a, I would I, uh, that's a good idea absolutely. Now, would you want to only add this in like at the very beginning of your? I assume this is for composting then, right? Yes. So then would you just add it in at the very beginning, like not later in the stage of composting? Um, or is it a concern? Uh, no, I, I just, you would have to look at what your total um, um, moisture balance is, I suppose. Okay. For your total, how much you would use, but generally I would say, um, yeah, I, I yeah, I guess if you add it later and you add too much nitrogen, then you could kickstart your composting again, right? So right. you may you may just want to do it on the front end, but. Okay. Excellent. 
Okay, well, I'd like to again thank you, Tom, for your presentation and then also for your Ask the Experts uh, session there. My pleasure. Um, so, yeah, on behalf of Green Manitoba, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Everyone have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, particip for participating. Okay.